Tonight we will be starting chapter 2, but first we have to finish chapter 1. So thank you for coming out tonight uh, to cover verse 18 again, and then we'll try to cover verse 1, maybe a little bit of verse 2, but we'll pick up verse 2 next week, there being so much material in that second verse. Uh, chapter 1 we spent 14 weeks in, this will be number 15, and so chapter 2 uh, is just as good, but uh, it will be a, a, little, a little less than 15 weeks, but uh, we'll spend at least a, a couple months probably on there, a month and a half in chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2, we finished the chapter talking about all in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. The issue, of course, is Paul trying to give an exhortation to Timothy, his son of the faith, to continue in the doctrine that Paul had received, was appointed to preach and teach the Gentiles, as Paul is going to depart. He's preparing for his death. Uh, Timothy will remain. And so he's trying to exhort, encourage, motivate, lay a, a, a groundwork of, of zeal and strength so that Timothy can continue in that which Paul has laid down as a foundation. And so he's dealing in chapter 1 about being unashamed of that. And in the immediate context, he's dealing with a few people, or all people in Asia. He said, all in Asia have turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. But Onesiphorus apparently had remembered Paul and refreshed Paul, having visited him, not being ashamed of his chain, seeking him out diligently, even at peril to his own life, and finding him and refreshing him uh, while he was in Roman prison. And so this is an example of being unashamed of the testimony of the Lord and the testimony of Paul, uh, which is what it says up, up in verse 8 that, that Timothy should do, not be ashamed of either testimony. And uh, so he was not, maybe at risk of his own house, which is why he says in verse 16, give mercy unto the house of Anesiphorus. Uh, this isn't just a, a single man, apparently. He has this whole house, and he, his actions put that house at risk. And yet, he did it out of faithfulness to the word. So, I want to deal with chapter eight, or chapter, uh, verse 18, rather, chapter 1. Uh, what this mercy is, and it says, Give mercy unto the house of Anesiphorus, in verse 18, grant unto him that he, be, he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. We saw in that day show up, again, uh, show up in verse 12 as well, where Paul says, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And so we see a day show up there as well as verse 18. Now, because we have someone visiting someone in prison, turn to Matthew 25, because Onesiphorus is visiting Paul in prison, the immediate cross-reference of most commentators, dispensational or not, is Matthew chapter 25. Even uh, Brother Stam, I believe, quotes Matthew 25 as, uh, isn't this familiar, visiting a prisoner in prison? Matthew 25 would be the wrong cross-reference for this yeah. verse in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, the reason why, though, is Jesus, in Matthew 25, verse 36, says that... Uh, I was hungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. And verse 37, then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee or thirsty and, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when we saw thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, as, For as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And that is the verse behind so many missionary charities, uh, because Jesus is teaching in Matthew 25 that if you do it to the least of these, then what happens in Matthew 25? We didn't read that part in this passage, but what's going on here is a judgment. A judgment of where they'll spend eternity. And if they do to the least of these, in the name of Jesus, according to this passage, they get eternal life and a kingdom. If they do not, skip down to verse 46, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous are the life eternal. See, what's on the line for visiting those in prison, the least of these apparently, is your eternal salvation. So you really don't get that far um, in the preaching of the passage, more just to help the least of these. But... That's what this is. And so this is a salvation passage in Matthew 25 before Christ's death on the cross. Now, your and I's salvation is based purely on Christ's death on the cross and resurrection for our sins. It's by grace, which is that it's not by our works. This chapter, by definition, lists a bunch of works that they should do to get eternal life in the name of Jesus Christ. And so this is not the gospel of the grace of God, which is why it's the wrong cross-reference. 
But commentators, because they see Onesiphorus visiting Paul in prison, and Paul praying for mercy, that God grant him mercy, they go, oh, that's Matthew 25. So what have they done? Totally destroyed the revelation of the mystery given to Paul, yeah. and ignored the gospel grace of God there. So uh, that's the connection they make. Now, if you go up to Matthew 25, 2 verse 31. There's a time frame in which this judgment occurs. <clears throat> I'm spending some time on this because, again, there are so many Christian missionary activities, including just general church preaching about how you should help the poor and, and the sick and those in prison uh, for this reason. Now, these are good works. Don't get me wrong. These are good works. But we know by the gospel grace of God, good works do not save you. And that's the point here. It's not that good works turn into works that shouldn't be done anymore, or good works are, are bad works now. It's that what, did the, what do the good works do for you? That would be the difference. Under grace, they do nothing for you. Of course, the good work might help someone else. And what do you call that if you're helping someone else by your own effort? Grace is what you call that. But if you're doing a good work in order to keep a covenant promise so that you can get eternal life, you're working for something. That's right. You see? That's a different type of thing. So grace actually teaches to do good works in the name of doing good works, not for your own salvation. Right? So there's a way to teach good works without using Matthew 25 to do it. But Matthew 25 has a time frame. Not only is it before Christ's death on the cross, which excludes it from being a grace preaching today, but verse 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep and the goats. He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, the sheep, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom, this is on earth, mind you, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Amen. And that's when he goes into, for I was hungered, and I was thirsty, and you helped me. So th this is Genesis 12, blessing Israel, and you getting blessed, being fulfilled here. When is Genesis 12, when God promised so many years ago uh, to Abraham and to the nations of the world, that if you bless Abraham's seed, or bless Israel, you get blessed, when does that blessing come? Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, there's nations that get blessed because they helped, it says the least of these. Now, He says the least of these, not just generally in humanity, my brethren is what He yeah. says. It's talking about helping Israel, blessing Israel who are the least of the nations, right? So that's the context there of Matthew 25. So I need to start out just with that dispensational point of pointing out in 2 Timothy 1 verse 18 where so many say, well, this is Matthew 25. And they just kind of leave it there like, oh, that's obvious. He's, he's visiting a prisoner. It's not obvious because the guy visiting the prisoner in Matthew 25 gets eternal life as a result of it. And what's odd is they'll come to Timothy, the second Timothy here, and they'll say, well, Paul's praying the Lord grant him mercy. Isn't that mercy unto salvation? Not if he's saved by grace, it's not. If someone's saved by grace, how can anybody, including the Apostle Paul, pray then for additional mercy for salvation? Christ did everything necessary to save you by His grace. If Onesiphorus is a believer in the gospel, the grace of God, then why would you pray the Lord grant him salvation? Your prayer wouldn't be meaningless for his salvation, first of all. But secondly, if God's grace did, was sufficient, then he's saved by it already if he's a believer. Right? So this is a terrible prayer to pray if he's talking about salvation. There's only two options here then. One is that he's not a believer of the gospel of the grace of God, maybe a part of the remnant or something, which there's no indication that's the case. He's from Ephesus, okay? Or secondly, Paul's not talking about salvation, which seems to be more in the context here. He's not talking about salvation. Matthew 25, judgment puts Onesiphorus in a conditional uh, situation about his eternity based on his blessing Israel. It would also make Paul... Uh, the na nation of Israel in representation as if he was holding some sort of covenant blessing that this force can get. Both of those are wrong. The day here Paul's talking about, grant him mercy of the Lord in that day, is the same day Paul's looking forward to in 2 Timothy 1 verse 12. Yeah. I committed unto Christ against that day. A day of judgment, no doubt. A day of facing the Lord, of course. It's the same day in chapter 4 verse 8. 2 Timothy 4 verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, you see I said it was a judgment? Because he's talking about the Lord, the judge here, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. When the Lord appears for Paul, when Paul appears before the Lord, or when we appear before the Lord, the righteous judge, what day is that? And this is what we're talking about. Paul mentions this day many times in his epistles. Look at Philippians 1, verse 6. This is going to end up being what's called the day of Christ. 
It's a day of reward. It's in 1 Corinthians 3 called the judgment seat of Christ. In first, or Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul is confident about the Philippians of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That'd be God working in them, which is grace. He's, he is going to perform it. He doesn't say, I'm confident that you will perform this yeah. until the day, but God's going to perform this in you. Now, how is Paul confident that God's going to continue this work in them, this sealing work by the Holy Ghost, this, this work that's going to save them? In them? Because it's by his grace, and God's able, and his grace is sufficient. And so Philippians 1 verse 6 mentions that day. Philippians 1 verse 10, Paul says, He prays that they might abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, not things that are different, which is what Stam titled his book. It's things that are excellent, Amen. which is different than different, yeah. right? Uh, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory. And uh, I skipped a verse here. That ye may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. So, Approving things that are excellent, you may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ. There's a constant orientation of Paul looking towards a day in which he will appear before the Lord and the work that was done in service to him that is judged for the, the sort that it was. And we've covered this many times before, especially in the last year and a half, of why you'd look forward to such a day. Because one question would be, well, why would, it's kind of a scary thought to hand in the test and be judged according to how you did, right? That's, that's like a scary thought. What if I get a bad grade back? Uh, I get red marks all over it. What if I say fail, fail? Of course, none of us are, are perfect. None of us are righteous. So no doubt there's going to be wasted time and wasted effort and this sort of thing. The reason why you look forward to it is because everything in this world that is vain, everything in this world that is not eternal, that is a burden to you, mortal flesh, sins around you, sin in yourself, will be gone on that day. That's why you look forward to it. <clears throat> so you look forward to that day because it's gone. What will get burned up and go away are the things you want to get burned up and go away. Do you understand? There'll be nothing that burns up and goes away on that day where you say, well, I wish that didn't happen. Otherwise, what are you thinking, right? And so you're looking for eternal life. You're thinking for the hope of glory. And so the time, of course, that you wasted now or the, the efforts or the works you did that were not the right kind of sort, not according to God's will, those also are fruitless on that day. But you'll realize that because you'll be in glory on that day. And you'll realize that what lasts in eternity is what remains, is what's there. And in fact, the reward. Paul says in Thessalonians, about the Thessalonians, that what is his crown and joy and rejoicing? He says, you are about Thessalonians. You are, right? And so he's confident that these Thessalonians on that day, they pass through to glory Amen. by God's grace, according to the mystery. Uh, they don't get burned up. They don't fall back, right? And so people get saved. Saints get edified. Uh, there's work that we do of the sort that lasts forever, yeah. according to God's Word, which is why we should try to study God's Word to understand His will, to be wise in it, and to operate accordingly, so that we can do work that has an eternal consequence. Amen. All right, that's the reason why we try to grow in understanding. Okay? And at the very least, our souls are saved for eternity. Right? It, 1 Corinthians 3 says that. So we praise God for that. Uh, that judgment, then, is one of a day of reward. It's a day of facing our Savior and Him actually redeeming our, or glorifying our body uh, so that uh, we get that reward for, for our salvation and also for service. So this is what Paul's talking about here. In Philippians 2.16, he says the same similar situation. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So you rejoice if you don't labor in vain. You're going to rejoice in heaven anyway, because what is left is the rejoicing, is glory, right? Uh, and yet, he wants to labor now. He's looking at his, his efforts now, and he wants the efforts now to continue on to glory. Well, it's not that he's trying to save himself, but he's trying to save others, yeah. you know, and they go on to glory. It's not that he's trying to say, look at me, God, I'm so great, but rather through God's grace to help others be built upon the building God's building. And that's the thing that, gets, that, that, that is sorted out forever. So Paul says, I don't want my labor to be in vain. I don't want to get in that day and, and say, well, everything you ever did and said was worthless. Who wants that? Right? Nobody. We say, what if it is? Praise God for his grace. You're saved forever. Right? What happens if it's not? Then praise God for his grace. It affected other people and it goes on forever. 
That's all going to be praise on that day, but Paul's looking forward to it. We have to look forward to that now, or else we will waste our time. Thus, Paul says to redeem the time, right? And so we orient ourselves that way. And so, regarding Anisiphorus, <clears throat> Paul's talking about the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ given to him, and Paul, of course, commits it to Timothy to hold fast and keep by the Holy Ghost. We've covered that already. It's talking about those who turned away from Paul. That's not going to be good. How can that help them do the right sort of work if they turn away from Paul? Like he's the apostle that dispenses the message that Christ appointed to the world today. It's not going to help them do the right sort of work. That's why that's bad. It's not that Paul says, it's me and my flesh, and I just want a following, and I hate the fact that people aren't following me anymore. That's not what he's saying. He's the dispenser of God's grace. They turn away from me, they turn away from the Lord, they turn away from what he's doing and his grace. It's not going to be good for them. Onesiphorus, however, not ashamed of what Paul was saying, what he was doing, why he's in prison, which wasn't for some sin or crime. It was for preaching the gospel of the grace of God. Is the force wasn't ashamed of that. Is he, isn't uh, that guy you're visiting a criminal? He's, he's a preacher of the gospel of the grace of God, and that's why he's there. That's not a crime at all. Right? He wasn't ashamed. He knew the truth of it. Yeah. And because of that, he refreshed Paul and uh, visited him and sought him out. That's why Paul says, the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy on the Lord in that day. That's the right sort of work, folks. And so, though his actions may have caused him peril, may cause his house trouble, especially since if his house is back in Ephesus or back in Asia, where a lot of turning away from Paul. You know, what happens there when the head of your house is going to seek Paul, and they're going, where's, where's Onesiphorus at? Knock, knock, where's Onesiphorus? And they're going, he, he's in Rome. What's he doing there? They're looking for Paul. And all of them are turned away from, from him. That, 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 that's going to be a struggle. So grant mercy on the house of Onesiphorus. Because he's doing the right sort of work, right? That's why he's, he's praying this here. And this force gives mercy to Paul. He asked the Lord to give mercy, the reward for faithful service to Nesiphorus. Now, he prays the prayer and mentions the Nesiphorus here about the Lord granting this. And we'll cover a little bit later what, how the Lord, he also prays the Ephesians, the Lord grant them something as well. But uh, Nesiphorus, because of Paul's prayer, because of his refreshing Paul, is now in Scripture. Like we're reading about him and talking about him. And he's an example of a faithful workman being unashamed of the chain of the mystery of Paul. For the last 2,000 years, do you think Onesiphorus' actions have bred any sort of faithfulness in other saints over the last two millennia? Do you think that's the right sort of work on that day? Amen. If people are, are, are to the glory of God, and Onesiphorus is a good example of that, on the day of Christ, you think people are going to say, I was encouraged by Onesiphorus. That's going to be a good work, isn't it? A good sort of work? Yeah. Even though it may have cost him something 2,000 years ago? Yeah. Right? So Paul's prayer, in a sense, has been answered. Lord, grant him mercy. Well, the Lord inspired words talking about this man, which encourages all of us, which on that day is going to make us stronger, to the glory of God, yeah. working through him. Right? See, that's how that works. So it's not that Onesa Forrest gets an extra cookie in heaven. It's that how many saints has he encouraged through his actions? Operating by God's grace, being unashamed of that. It's the same with you. That's the example. If you're faithful to the word and faithful to what God has given us to do, even though it's not your salvation, you don't have to do some work to save yourself. But your faithfulness encourages others to stand fast and encourages others to be saved and believe it, to follow it. Yeah. Then what happens? That's the right sort of work, folks. And on that day, there'll be people in glory you won't even know about because they see your faithfulness. Yeah. Right? They see your example of that. God's grace working in you. And praise God for that. So here's Onus of Forest, an example 2,000 years ago, continuing to be an example today. Right? So how is Paul's prayer answered? I think it has been already, uh, even though that day hasn't come yet. With that, we start chapter 2. And chapter 2 begins with thou therefore, that archaic English word that no one understands. What is thou exactly? <laughs> uh, of course, it means you, just like the word ye. It all means you in different uh, grammatical contexts. Thou being singular, I'm of singular speaking about Timothy. He says, thou therefore. So therefore, a more pertinent word here, uh, Paul is making a case in chapter 2 that because of what you just learned in chapter 1, therefore, chapter 2. And so there's a connection here, obviously, between chapter 1 and 2. And uh, what he's ended up saying here is don't be ashamed like Phygelus and Hermogenes. There's a, a summary of chapter 1. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord or his prisoner, like for jealous and Hermogenes. Rather, be faithful, like Onesiphorus. That's how he ends the chapter. 
Thou therefore, be my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Chapter 1, as we covered in our outline some 15 weeks ago in our introductory lesson, chapter 1 can be summarized as a faithful testimony. Like, what's the faithful message? What is that message? In chapter 1, we spent two weeks in verses 9, 10, and 11 where Paul's detailing this message that was appointed to him and telling Timothy, don't be ashamed of this because it's powerful, it's saving, and it's something that, yes, causes you affliction, but it's true. Right, so stand fast with that. And so we covered the, the testimony and what it means to have that faithful testimony. The power of the word of his grace. Remember verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. He goes on to talk about that message that we've been given. Right? So chapter 1 is faithful testimony. Get that right. Chapter 2 then, thou therefore, knowing what a faithful testimony looks like, the message from Christ working in people, what's a faithful workman look like? That's chapter 2. Since you know what a faithful testimony is, hold fast to that and keep it. Therefore, be strong in it and be that faithful workman. That's chapter 2. So chapter 2, we're going to see plenty of examples of what a faithful workman is. It won't get into very much of what the message is. We'll cover a little bit of that, but that was already covered in chapter 1. Timothy knows the message, right? And so we're going to talk about preparing for the work of his grace. Isn't that an amazing concept that um, grace is not your work that saves you, but in order to minister grace to others, it requires your work. You understand that? And so if you're going to minister grace to someone else, someone's got to work for that. When someone preached the gospel to you, someone worked for that. Right? So this is what this is talking about, talking to a minister, Timothy, about how to do ministry and be a faithful workman. And there is a difference between a workman and a faithful workman. There is a difference. And we'll talk about that in the weeks to come. Uh, but, but tonight, just an introduction here to chapter 2. He says, Thou therefore, my son. Now he said that also in chapter 1, verse 2, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. In 1 Timothy, he calls him mine own son after the faith. Here it's my dearly beloved son. In chapter 2, again, Thou therefore, my son, be strong, is what he says. Paul, in this whole epistle, is charging Timothy like a father does a son. And that is different than, say, just a teacher. In 1 Corinthians 4, you remember Paul said to the Corinthians, you have many instructors, a thousand instructors, but not many fathers. And then he starts to rebuke them. <laughs> That's what a father does. An instructor teaches you what you do with it, what do they care? A father will try to teach you, and what the, you do with it, they do care quite a bit. Right? That's a difference. But in 1 Thessalonians 2.11, we see an example or definition of what this looks like. Paul says, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children. So what's a father do? They exhort, motivate you to action, right? They comfort, or rather strengthen you when you face opposition, and charge you, which is to give you the task and make sure you do it, right? That's what fathers do to their children. And this is what Paul's doing here in chapter two now. Thou therefore, my son, speaking as a father, be strong. Exhortation, strong is the definition of what comfort is. And, it, and there's a charge that goes with this. Be the faithful workman. Commit this to faithful men. You need to do this task. Right. So we see all those attributes here in chapter 2. Also, when he says, my son, there's something doctrinally we could, we could speak to about that. In Galatians 4, verse 7, Paul speaks to the Galatians about the difference between a child and a full-grown son. And uh, we, d we don't always have that distinction when we use it in English to say, you know, well, a son, that can be a little boy or an old man, you know, a son. But uh, in the scripture, when it talks about son, quite often it's talking about a full-grown, mature, someone who's ready to take over what the father gives him as an inheritance, uh, as opposed to a child, which is not ready at all for what a son is going to do, take over what the father is giving him. But in Galatians chapter 4, he, he makes this description. And he says in verse 7, Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, talking about us, talking about the Galatians, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So you see, a child is no different than a servant as long as they're a child. They're under tutors and governors, verse 1 and 2. But when the time comes that that child is no longer a child, pointing to the father, they're a son. It says in verse 7, they're an heir of God. They start receiving the things and are capable to do the things that God's entrusted them to do. Now, this fits perfectly with Timothy. 
Because Timothy's not a new believer. He's not a baby in Christ. He is one that has already, he already knows what to do. He's been trained in it. He's followed Paul around. He knows his manner of life and all this business, his doctrine, his faith. And Paul is exhorting him to be that which you, you are intended to be, right? Walk in that which you have. So you can read that into, into 2 Timothy 2, verse 1 as well. Timothy being called my son. A son operates under grace, a servant or child under law. That's Galatians 4, 1 and 2. A child is no different than a servant when he's a child. He's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. And so he's like, how do you teach your children? How do, how, do you, how do you operate towards your children? Should we treat them like God treats us in the dispensation of grace? Well, we're all living under that dispensation, so they need, they need to learn the gospel and all that business. But they're children, which means they need to learn first the lesson of the law, which is sin and obedience and justice and righteousness. And you are the minister of that as their parents, yeah. knowing all the while, just as God knew all the while under the law, that grace is going to be given to them. There's a very good dispensational understanding about that. But there's a time, especially in this dispensation, since you know what, what God's doing, that your son, your, your child should grow up to be that son, that full-grown, mature person operating under grace. When you operate under grace, then you have no longer any obligation to the tutor or the governor, right? And so here's this full-grown son. They leave the house. They get the job. They do the work to make their choices. And, you know, parents say, well, I hope they do that right. Well, yeah, you can still exhort them. You can still encourage them and charge them. But it's like you, you, you no longer have a, a hold on them, right? Well, that's grace, isn't it? Just like us with God. We're not under the law. God doesn't punish us when we misbehave. Neither does he bless us when we do something right in the dispensation. Because we're not under his tutelage anymore. Amen. But he exhorts and he comforts and he says, this is what you should do. You should do good works. And then he leaves it to us to whether we do or not. That's what grace is. Right? Now, if we're under the law, when you don't do good works, he strikes you with lightning or something. You know, that's like that. So when the skeptics say, why does he strike me with lightning? Well, they're thinking of the law dispensation. And, yeah. and even then there was grace given, but... So Paul says, my son, he's going to exhort and charge Timothy, but Timothy's going to have to make the choice. Yeah. He's going to have to do it on his own, which is going to have more than one meaning here because Paul's about to leave. He's about to die. And so it's not just him being grown up. It's that Paul's leaving. He's no longer going to have daddy to lean on. Right. So he's really going to have to operate on his own by God's grace, which is why he says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Because... It's not something where Paul says, all right, Timothy, you need to be strong in how many people actually agree with us. I mean, even though we're not a popular majority, we still have quite a few people. Right. Is this comforting to hear? There's more than you? That is comforting. But your strength shouldn't come from how many people agree with you. Right. I mean, it's fine to talk about that. It's fine to rejoice in other people who are like-minded and to gather with the church and members of the body of Christ. That's very good to rejoice in. But Paul says, your strength, Timothy, as a minister of the gospel, will not come from numbers. He says, be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As Paul did, he says, if I'm the only one standing, I'll be the only one standing, because I stand by, in God's grace in Jesus Christ. It's not on your feelings, is what he says to Timothy. He says, be strong in the feelings. Now that I've encouraged you and exhorted you, now you're feeling it, you're zealous for it. That's not how you're going to find strength. But that is how a lot of us find strength on a daily basis. How do you feel today? Not having a good day. So you're weak. That's a hard one to get past. I mean, it's easier said than done to say, well, don't rely on your feelings. Yeah, yeah, we shouldn't do that. But we do all the time, right? It's not very easy to say, well, I feel terrible, but I'm, going, I'm still going to be strong. Where do you get that strength from? You feel terrible. You're weak. Right? It's going to be somewhere else, right? But your feelings and how you think things are happening. I feel fearful. I feel... Like the circumstances around me are in turmoil. I feel like the world's against me. I feel like no one likes me. I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. How do you know you're saved? Why well, feel? Well, that shouldn't matter. What about your ministry? How's it doing? Why well, feel? It doesn't really matter how you feel. Like, what's going on? Are you holding fast to the word or not? Yes. Right? How's your ministry doing? Oh, we've got an increase of 50 people. That doesn't tell me nothing. Are you holding fast to the word? Are you keeping that thing the same which was committed to Timothy, committed to down to the line to you? Are you holding fast to the word of truth? Amen. If you're holding fast to the word of the truth and to give it to people, then praise God. But you can get a lot of people just by not holding fast. I mean, so that doesn't tell me nothing when you tell me numbers. 
or I feel it's going great. Well, okay, feelings are not bad, but like, what are you, how are you holding fast? What is the criteria here? You see? So it's not just your feelings, it's not the circumstances. It's not keeping the law, of course. It's in the grace, is what Paul says. Yeah. It's not looking for signs. It's not either in Paul. Be strong in Paul. That's not what he says, is it? So we call ourselves Pauline in that we find our doctrine and our, our gospel and all that in the epistles of the apostle that Christ appointed to be a teacher of the Gentiles in the scripture. There's nothing wrong with that. But our strength doesn't come from Paul the person. The epistles, yes, God wrote them, right? The epistles of grace that God wrote, yes. But Paul the person, no. But Timothy, very really, I mean, he traveled with Paul, ministered with Paul the person, and here's Paul, the person, about to die. He doesn't say, be strong, remember me, Timothy, because, you know, I had some strength, and, you know, remember my strength. And, no, he says, be strong in grace. Because yeah. God's grace is always sufficient, and Christ dwells in you, just as he dwells in me. Yeah. And so you don't need me, you need Christ. You need his grace. Amen. Right? And this is what he's saying, too. So that's a good thing to recall. It's not about any person, but the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he says to be strong in. I want to talk a little bit here about strength. When he says, be strong. Now, in chapter 1, he told Timothy not to be ashamed. He told him to hold fast the form of sound words. And then he, he told him that good thing which was committed to the keep by the Holy Ghost. So he's keeping this, this committed word. He's holding fast the form of sound words. And keeping something and holding to it has kind of the sense of you're in the midst of a storm, right? You're in the midst of people trying to take it from you. Just hold on, right? And, uh, of course, you need strength to do that. He says, by the Holy Ghost. But... When you're telling someone to be strong or to be mighty or powerful, this is like an offensive type of statement, like a statement of taking offense. People are attracted to people who are strong. People, naturally, we're weak. You know, we think ourselves strong from time to time, that circumstances allow, but we are, as human beings, weak. And when we see someone of strength exhibiting strength, we are naturally attracted to it, right? It'll be physical, mental, skillful, spiritual, we're attracted to places and people of strength. Now, of course, our strength, as the verse says, should come from God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the, the exhortation to Timothy to be strong is another level than just hold fast the word. Just you hold it. He's like, I got it. You're not doing nothing with it. You're just holding it, right? Being strong is I got it. It's like the running back. I don't got two arms. I got the one arm. Right? I got a one arm. Well, they go, well, put two arms in that thing. I got it. I'm so strong, I've got some of you are going, what in the world are you talking about? But, <laughs> you're so strong that you're going to run with the thing. That's, that's the thought here. You haven't just fallen on it, and you're just going to lay there on top of the ball, you're going to run with it. And that's what's going to happen in chapter 2. A workman is going to do work, and, and Paul's going to teach what it looks like to do a faithful work. What a faithful workman looks like, uh, what a, the athlete looks like, what the farmer, look, the husbandman looks like, um, so that when he's doing ministry, he'll know whether or not he's exhibiting those attributes of strength, right? And so, to be strong, Paul's saying, require, is going to be, you're going to do some work in ministry with other people. If you're not strong in God's grace, you cannot minister to other people. You understand? If you're weak in it, there's nothing you can do except be ministered to, which is a useful place. Some of you are going, well, that's me. I'm weak in it. Well, okay, well, then you're in the right place. What you need to do is find some people strong in God's grace and be ministered by God's grace and praise God for that. But the, the, the end is always for you to be strengthened. Yeah. The word comfort means to be strengthened. And he's the God of all comfort, and he gets comfort, you get comfort by his grace. But what's that mean? What's this strength that Paul's talking about? We understand physical strength. You might understand uh, uh, you know, different skill sets and mental abilities and that type of personal fleshly strength. But what's the strength Paul's talking about? Look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 17. Paul says in verse 16, And my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that I not be laid to their charge. So he prays that those who forsook him don't get held accountable for it. Verse 17, notwithstanding, when everyone else left him alone, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. How did he strengthen Paul exactly? This is very common Christian talk. God strengthens me. 
that I'm trying to, fig try to figure out, try to communicate here, how that is. Because it's not going to be that you're feeling weak in your flesh and God's going to heal you. God's going to give you that money that you blew last week because you don't have enough to pay your bills now. And so he's going to relieve you by just giving you the moral hazard of giving you what you ask for every time you pray for it. That's not the type of strength that God promises you in this dispensation. So how is the Lord strengthening Paul? As the Lord stood with him and strengthened him, is what he says. Paul is in prison. He's about to die. This is like four verses before the final word of Paul, and he goes to die. And he says, the Lord strengthened me. He's dead. He's going to be dead. Martyr for the faith. Is that the strength, strength of the Lord? According to Paul, it was. You see? We've got to change the way we think about the strength we get from Christ. And we have to be strong in it. Lord, strengthen me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. He says he'll deliver me from every evil work, and then he gets killed. All right? Paul wasn't wrong. He's talking about those evil works. All they can do is kill my body. Read Philippians 1. Right? He'll glorify Christ in his life or his death. All that evil work can do cannot take anything away from his eternal position and his glory. All it can do is take his body away, which means he's in glory faster. So they can prevent Paul from co continuing his ministry on the earth, but they cannot kill the message. And this is why Paul writes to Timothy. Because right? God's grace isn't dependent upon the strength of men, but on his own finished work. The strength of the Lord is what Paul's talking about. Look at Ephesians 6, verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10. It's not the strength of Paul. Paul did ministry not by his own strength, but by the strength of God's grace. He says this in Ephesians 3. He says it in 1 Corinthians 15. What does that mean, however? Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's the beginning of the section talking about, maybe in your Bible it has that headline, the armor of God, right? Armor makes you strong, of course. That's the metaphor. But the beginning is, be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You will not be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You will not have strength if you do not put these things on. What are the things? You may have heard many messages on them, but the things are... He uses the metaphor of actual armor, but everything is going to be something about the message of God's grace, yes. the word of God. Yes. Okay. Take the whole armor of God. Verse 14, your loins are girt about with words, apparently, truth, and having on the breastplate of, well, how do you get righteousness? By faith. The words, right? Yeah, Christ's righteousness. Yeah. This is not you doing good works. This is like, you know, righteousness by faith. Right? So it's something you believe. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Yeah, it's real peace, but it's a message that communicates how you get it. The way of peace they have not known, Paul says, but I'm preaching to you how to get peace justified by faith, Romans 5, verse 1. It's a message of peace, the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of truth. This is all words here, folks. And it says, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation, which you cannot be saved unless you hear words and trust them, the gospel of the grace of God. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Everything they're putting on here are words. And I'm, I'm saying that on purpose, because in 2 Timothy 2, when Paul exhorts Timothy to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, there's a definition to that. It's not just some mystical, spiritual, God, give me grace, and I'm going to feel it here in a moment. It has to do with the message that Christ communicated that we already covered in chapter 1. That's what you need to be strong in. Like, you need to know it frontwards and backwards. You need to believe it, be fully persuaded in it. You need to be strong in that message. Walk in it, apply it to your life, so that you can walk with that armor on. If you don't know righteousness by faith, you don't know salvation by grace, if you don't know what faith is and what your faith is in, or the Word of God rightly divided, you can't put that armor on God. I said, why are we studying the Word of God? Why, why, we, why is it always about doctrine with you, Justin? Because that is the strength of the Lord in this dispensation. Amen. You cannot be strong without sound words. And in 2 Timothy 2, that's what this is going to be about. If you want strength from the Lord is where it's going to be, it's going to be His words that give the strength. Look at Ephesians 3.16. 
Ephesians 3.16. I told you in chapter 1, verse 18, Paul prays the Lord grant mercy unto Nesiphorus on that day, right? That's not the only place he prays that someone be granted something. Ephesians 3.16 is the other place. He says, I bow my knees unto the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he, God, the Lord, would grant you, the Ephesians, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. There's no problem with 2 Timothy 1, verse 18. Right? If, if this prayer makes sense in Ephesians 3, so does that prayer in 2 Timothy 1. This isn't about salvation, Ephesians 3. This is about saints being strengthened by the might of the Lord, which is by his spirit that dwells in you. And where is this strength coming from? Is it an external strength? Is it in your feels? Is it in your circumstances? It's in the inner man. Well, how do you reach the inner man? With words, doctrine, what you believe, yeah. faith, reaches the inner man, right? Law doesn't. Law is external. Do this, do that. But the message of faith and grace, that goes to the heart. You have to believe it for it to have effectual work. And that effectual work is strong because the message is about Christ and about what he did and about what he's doing and who, who he made you to be. So it's strength from the Lord. It's strength in the inner man. Look at verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. You see it? Well, Christ is in me. Indeed, he is by grace. How? By faith is what it says. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you don't know what you're believing, then how do you know Christ dwells in you? Christ dwells in me. How do you know? Right. Well, the gospel of the grace of God teaches me that. The Holy Spirit baptized me into his body. I'm a member of his body. That's the mystery of Christ. I mean, you, you know the scriptures. Rely on these words. This is why it's such a heinous crime. On Sunday, the lesson was why I love the Bible. Why it's such a crime to remove the Bible as an infallible source of authority for the Christian. Because that is our strength. Amen. And it is infallible. Yeah. And people, of course, have been trying to attack it, and they still do so today, even in churches. That mistake here, mistake there, craziness there. Mm -hmm. Right? But it stands, folks. It's, yeah. It stands as the word of truth. Peter 3.17, that Christ dwells in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. You see, if you're rooted, that means wind can't blow you about, right? Amen. And if you're grounded, you're not flying in the air. Rooted and grounded is a position of strength, right? And it says rooted and grounded in love. Christ dwells in your heart by faith, and you're rooted and grounded in love, right? Back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy 1. Down in verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That's why he said that. He's not throwing out spiritual words or something. It's because Christ dwells in you by faith. And you're rooted and grounded in his love. Like, it's his love, not the fact that you loved him so much. You, you talk about different ministries and what their strength is, and it's like, well... We're so passionate for the Lord. That's our strength. And it's like, well, no, no, no. Your strength isn't what God's love was toward you. If it depends on your passionate love for him, that's going to waver when that goes up and down, depending on how many worship songs you sing. That's not strong at all. That's just like you get that for a few days, you have to sing it again. But God's love committed in the death of Jesus Christ for you while you were a sinner is strong all the time. Amen. You see? So he says, keep that thing, hold fast, in faith, what you know, and in love. That's the love of Jesus Christ. Not your own love toward him, but his love toward you. Right? So that's what strengthens you. That's what roots you and grounds you. Because even though you're not lovable, God loved you while you're a sinner. That'll ground you. That'll establish you. Right? So strengthen the inner man. Look at Colossians 2. It's strength in what we learn. Again, dealing with words here. Just like physical bodily exercise and strength requires training, your muscles have to learn. We use that language in, in sport, right? In physical exercise. Your muscles have to learn a behavior, an action, a movement, strength. Well, in Colossians, the same thing. We learn words and doctrines which are what strengthen us in Christ. Colossians 2, verse 7. He says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, which is by faith and grace, so walk ye in him, which is by grace and faith. Verse 7, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith. Again, rooted, that's a position of strength. 
Grounded, position of strength. Established, position of strength. How? In the faith, as ye have been taught. What if you don't know what you believe and you haven't been taught anything? You're going to be weak. Do you see? I mean, it's just a natural state of things. It's not that you're predestined to be weak and someone else is predestined to be strong. When I didn't know the Bible rightly divided, I was weak, not rooted and grounded. Everyone is like, you're all not rooted and grounded when you don't know what the Bible says. And so all of us then can be rooted and grounded and established when we learn what God teaches us through his word rightly divided. As you received him, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught. All right? This is why we talk about teaching so much. Yes, you preach. We dealt with preaching also in 2 Timothy, but without the doctrine, without the information, there's nothing to preach at either. There's such a thing as preaching and motivating people to do things not based on any truth. You do some politics all the time. Right? Rhetoric, motivating people to, to vote, to move, get out the vote. I, I still baffles me. Get out the vote. Like, for who? I can't tell you that. Just get out the vote. Get out your vote. It's like, you could be helping the enemy, you understand. It's like, didn't you only want people to vote who are going to vote for you? But, you know, that's a political issue, I guess. But as you've been taught, there's doctrines, there's truth, there's words that matter in being ministers of the word, of the gospel, of God's grace. So strength is from the Lord. Strength is in the inner man. Strength comes from what we learn. Look at Philippians 4, verse 11. Paul learned things. He was communicated and given information and doctrine from the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he had to learn things about that. <laughs> There's two different things. He was given revelations, and he's like, wow, okay, that's something. He tries to understand it, tries to learn it. Part of learning, the, fir the first thing, a step in learning is to hear. Even when you hear and you're familiar with what you heard, you're not done learning. People tend to think that. They think, well, I I've heard Justin say that. I've heard teachers teach this, and I can, re re I can regurgitate it back. I've heard it, I can say it, I know the answer. That's different. You hearing it's different than you actually understanding it. Yeah. So you first have to hear it, be familiar, and then you gotta understand the thing. And then after you understand it, then you actually gotta walk in it. And there's another level of learning, where it's like, okay, I understood the thing, but until I actually went to battle, I didn't know how useful that weapon was, right? I have a greater understanding and learning of it. Let me insert uh, four, rather, verse 11. Verse 13, Paul says in the, in the famous passage on our bookmarks across Christianity, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The emphasis is not on you doing all things. It's how you do all things, which is through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's the point. And what are the all things? Back up to verse 11. He says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned. I have learned. In whatsoever state I am, there were to be content. He had to learn that, you understand. He wasn't born with that knowledge, especially by grace. It wasn't something that he immediately under, understood. He was communicated the fact that Christ said, you're going to suffer some things for my sake. It's not out of punishment to you. It's just that's how it's going to be. Paul had to learn that though he was facing suffering, he still had a position of peace and justification before God. He had to learn that. He says, I learned, whatsoever state I am, there what to be content. I know now that I've learned it, both how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to be abound and to suffer need. I can do all things, which is abound or suffer need. When people say I can do all things, they quote the verse. Normally, they only want one part of that lesson. Yeah. I, can do all th I can be rich and abound because I can do all things. What about poor and suffer need? Well, oh, oh, Christ would never want that for me. That's how Paul learned it. He learned both ways. So you got to learn both to understand what contentment is. I see. And how can you learn both? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me because it's Christ and his strength, his grace that strengthens his inner man. Yeah. Whatever the circumstance is, the strength I have is in Christ. Because right? he knows something, doesn't he, about Christ. So how can I be strong? How can I be a stronger Christian? You got to learn some things. That's how you get stronger. You've got to understand the things you've learned. Then you've got to put them to practice. And you become strong because tribulation works patience and experience. And then hope. That's strength, folks. Right? So that's how you get strength. So Paul, again, is saying, don't, don't follow me. Don't be a follower of, of me like the person. He says, uh, be strong in grace. The strength of the Lord. 
strength, look at 2 Corinthians 12, the strength of the Lord in your inner man that we have to learn from the doctrines of, of God's grace that re revealed to the Apostle Paul is something that we need when we're weak, apparently. So apparently, being strong in God's grace means you're going to have to learn to be uh, at home in the weakness of your flesh. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Jesus responded to Paul after Paul besought the Lord thrice for a thorn of his flesh. Christ says, my grace is sufficient, which means my grace is strong and capable to do all that you need to do. Amen. To which Paul could have sarcastically responded, well, I can't remove this thorn from my flesh. To which Christ would say, it's not about your flesh. I crucified your flesh. Remember? Didn't get that far. Paul already knew that part. He already wrote, I am crucified with Christ. He understood his flesh was nothing to boast in or to try to claim preservation of. But he said, Christ says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength, the strength of God, the strength of the Lord, the strength of his grace, is made perfect in weakness. That is your weakness. So you want to be strong in God's grace? Guess what that means? You're going to have to learn to accept the fact that you're weak. And that's hard when you're not in your flesh. It's, it's hard when you're weak in your flesh, too, but at least you have the opportunity to learn it. When you're strong in your flesh, you're healthy, you're young, you're skilled, you're wealthy, you're powerful in your flesh, it's hard to learn, which is why Paul says there's not many noble, not many rich. Because it's harder than to learn that you are weak. That's how Christ is strong. Because you, you think, well, I, I got it made. I'm not that weak. Right? So... When you're sick, you're unhealthy, you're dying, you're opposed, you're in jail, you have no esteem, you're poor. Those are good opportunities through by faith to work patience and experience, hope and the strength to see the sufficiency of God's grace. It's how low you can go that you test the strength of God's grace, right? It's not how high you can go. Of course, even then, God's grace puts you in a position higher than you can ever attain. That's already a given. But it's also sufficient for the lowest you can ever be. So that's why Christ's strength is made perfect in your weakness. Most gladly, Paul says, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul is exercising here the exhortation he gave to Timothy to be strong in the grace. That's 2 Corinthians 12. Paul's learning it right there. Right? He's telling Timothy to that. Timothy, you're going to face afflictions. He already said to be a partaker of them. But now he's saying be strong in them according to the strength of God's grace which means you recognize your weakness. It's there, right? You may even try to remove it because it might help your ministry not to be so weak, right? Which is fine. But Paul couldn't remove the thorn in his flesh. He's at an end. So he prays to God to remove it. And it's not removed. And so he rests in the strength of God's grace because it's sufficient. I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong in Christ. Right? Christians, when they face that list right there, persecution, necessity, reproaches, and infirmities, they're constantly trying to get rid of them or they pity the people who have them. They run away from ministry work for sure. Right? Sorry, I can't minister because I'm so weak. Well, I understand suffering and that sort of business, and you, and you sympathize with people in their flesh. At the same time, it's like your weakness is exactly where grace can be magnified. Because grace is not you. Grace is him. Right. So the fact that you're weak and people are trying to help you in your sickness and you say, well, praise God that this thing kills me, I'm in heaven. I mean, when someone tries to help someone who's sick, that, that's like the most caring this world gets. Right. When they try to help the poor, the sick, the Matthew 25 actions. Yeah. Right. The whole cry for supporting Ukraine or the immigrants or whomever is all based on a charitable response. These people need things. We pity their condition. We're trying to help them, right? What if the person who was being pitied responded with, I'll glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it be my life or by my death? You're there trying to provide charity, and they're ministering to you. Yeah. That's interesting. That'd be something, right? You hear that every now and then from a North Korean Christian. <laughs> Bless their hearts over there in North Korea. They can't even have Bibles over there at all. And so they, they write the verses down on toilet paper, memorize them, and flush them down the toilet. And, uh, you know, sometimes they want them to escape. 
they'll escape out of the country and they'll just testify to Christians outside the country of how great it is to have a God's Word, how great it is to not be persecuted. And while they were there, how great it was just to have those verses they could memorize. And like we Christians in the West are going, memorization, huh? I haven't done that in a while. I'm just going on my phone, you know. But we have it so well. But you see, you can minister and testify of the strength of God's grace when you're weak. Yeah. Be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is a good preparation for affliction. Yeah. Right? Is what that is. If you don't strengthen yourself in what God says about His grace and how His grace is sufficient now, when the weakness occurs, you're going to be totally distracted by your flesh. Right? And so, he's trying to create a workman here. This is part of that workmanship. Now, he says, be strong in the grace. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, be strong in the grace. It is in the grace. Again, it's not in the law. It's not in the covenant. <laughs> it's in the grace. That grace, grace means something given. It's something given on your behalf, something done for you that you couldn't attain. And uh, if you're looking for that thing that was given, you, you don't have to look any further than chapter 1, where he, we learned about that testimony. In verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. What did he give us by his grace? Strength, strength, and strength. You see that? What defeats fear? Strength. When you're in control, you're not afraid. That's why people are afraid of things in this world. They respond with, well, God is in control. Well, we're not Calvinist here, which is typically what that is, is articulating. That God is controlling the reins of these things, which really makes God a monster and a moral mess. That's not true. But if you're articulating that God has a purpose for this dispensation, which is to preach God's grace to see souls saved and saints edified, then that's true. Okay. That's typically not what people mean by it, but the idea that God has given us a response to fear, which is to strengthen our inner man, is what Paul's communicating. Okay. They are trying to, trying to alleviate fear by maintaining control. But you don't have to make up something about God to maintain control. Because if you're saved by God's grace, then you're in his body. There's nothing this world can do about that. You're more than conquerors, Romans chapter 8, right? So the world will be the world. <laughs> it will keep doing what the sinful evil world does. And you in Christ are not changed. That's how you respond to those situations. There's a lot of evil in this world. What do we do about it? Uh, we need to get people saved out of this world then, apparently. Amen. That's how you do that. To, to believe the lie that you're going to bring peace on earth is it's not happening. That's not our mission. That's not our ministry. Be strong in the grace. It doesn't say, be strong that the kingdom is coming. You know, no, no, it's be strong in the grace. Yeah. Grace means God is not punishing the wicked today, nor blessing the righteous today. Be strong in his grace. Amen. Right? That means there's going to be evil things happening in the world. Yep. Better be strong in his grace. We've said that before, too. You know, how do Christians respond if they know God's grace to every evil thing that happens every other week? Um, why is God allowing these things to happen? His grace. That's why he's allowing it to happen. Yeah. Which you have to explain after you say that. I don't mean the Calvinistic grace. I don't mean that God just, you know, moving things behind the scenes or something like that. What I mean is that the fact that God is saving people by his grace, not their works, means he's not judging people who do bad works, and he's not blessed people who do right works, which means if you do a bad work, you're not going to be judged by God for it today. In the future, you'll, you'll be judged by God. Yeah. But not today. Thus, bad works happen. You see? Why does God allow them? Because of his grace. Yeah. That's why. If he intervened to prevent every evil work, then you all be dead too, and salvation by grace would end tomorrow. Yeah. Right? You, you, God can't be offering salvation by grace to people that he's judging for their works. Right. Why does God allow evil to happen? Because of his grace. That's why. He, he is doing his grace today. He's dispensing his grace. That's what we're supposed to minister. That's how we respond to this evil world, with grace. We've got to be strong in that, folks. Yeah. Our name is, is, is meaningless other than just a label, but... Grace ambassadors. Why do we put grace on there? You can find Grace Covenant Church down the road. You can find a Grace Catholic Church. It's just meaningless, the words on signs. But because we're trying to be strong in grace. Like it, it's a doctrine that's so important if you understand it correctly. Amen. Like it defines what God is doing. It defines how we're saved. Yes. It defines who we are. Right? Amen. Be strong in grace. That's a pretty good exhortation there. There's a lot to that. Grace is what God gave us. He gave us strength in the face of fear, which he says is power, love, and a sound mind. All those things are strength. In verse 9, he says he, he saved us and called us, so he gave us a holy calling and salvation, according to his purpose and grace. Right? 
In verse 13, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. There's something Timothy received from Paul, from the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 14, that good thing which was committed unto thee. What is that? That's this message of grace, right? That's what Paul's been communicating here. Look at Romans 4. Be strong in the grace. Romans 4. The fact that it's grace requires it be faith. Do you understand? Yeah. If grace is what God does on your behalf, and we know what that was. He died for our sins and rose from the dead. He gave us these things freely. He gave us this salvation and calling freely. It requires that be received by faith. Because grace, the message of grace, is what God did for you when you couldn't do it for yourself. The response to that is, yeah, I believe that. If you don't believe it, then you have no, no involvement in it. The only thing you can respond to grace with is, I believe that, thank you. Right? The message of grace. Romans 4, verse uh, 20, look what it says about Abraham. Abraham, the pillar of faith here, staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham, it was told him that he'd have a son, even though he was old, his wife was old, he didn't have any children, and he was strong in faith, believing what God said. God said, I will do, which is what grace is. I did, or I'm going to do for you. And Abraham said, I believe it. Okay, I believe it. Yeah. Strong in faith, right? Back up to verse 16. Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. You see? If God says he's going to do something, or that he did something, in our case, he already did the work, it has to be by faith. Like, you have to believe it, or else it's by a work, which negates the whole point of God doing it. Do you see the logic there? Paul's saying it's a faith that it might be by grace. Or in other words, grace requires faith. It doesn't require faith if you do something. You just do it. But if God does something, you've got to believe that he's going to do or has done the thing which he said he would do. Thus, Paul says, I am persuaded. I've committed unto him because he believes, right? Yeah. So be strong in grace. You got to have faith, which means strong in grace is accompanied by strong faith, isn't it? Amen. I want to strengthen my faith. Well, that's what Paul's saying. Be strong in the grace, which is to say, you better understand what I'm teaching you, what you're learning, and what you know by God's words. Faith, and be strong in that, yeah. right? Romans chapter 5, verse 2. By whom also we have access into this grace. How? By faith. Wherein we stand. That's a strong position. Standing. And rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Why? By faith we stand in grace. But what's that mean to stand in grace? Well, grace is what Christ did for you, what he's done that you couldn't do, all that. Well, it's only by faith that we stand there. Yeah. And so it's not our effort to believe. It's what we're believing which is so strong. Don't get that confused. Don't think, I have strong faith, which means I'm a really good faith producer. No, faith doesn't come from you. Faith comes from the word of God that you heard that you believe. So your faith is only as strong as what you're believing. Do you understand? And what you believe in this dispensation is that there's no work anybody can do to save themselves. And you trust the finished work of Jesus Christ. You trust Christ glorified and resurrected. I mean, this is some strong stuff you're believing here. Yeah. There's a lot that can come from this. You see, It's not just, I believe God can do, which all the scripture teaches that. I believe he can do. Well, how? I don't know. I don't know that part. Right. When? I, I don't know that part either. What about your faith? Do you know how God did? I do know how God did. Do you know when he did? I do know when he did. Do you know that you're saved? I can know that. Yeah. There's a lot of strength in knowing things that we know today, Amen. according to God's word. So be strong in grace means you be strong in faith. Therefore, to be strong in grace, as Paul's exhorting Timothy, is to be strong in the words, in yeah. the doctrine, in the message. That's what that means. So I'm making it very practical here. I'm trying to make it practical. How do I be strong in grace? I mean, it's an exhortation to Timothy. How do I do that? He's saying be strong in the words, strong in the message, strong in the faith. That's going to be important for the rest of the chapter here. Look at 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. 1 Timothy 4. There's going to be people who in the latter, latter times depart from the faith in verse 1. Then in verse 6, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2 is going to talk about how to be a good, faithful minister of Jesus Christ. 
And he says here in 1 Timothy, if you put them in remembrance of, you know, warning them about these things and what the proper words are, proper doctrines, not doctrines of devils, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. You see that? Why is he a good minister? Because you're nourished up, strengthened up, you're healthy, you're ready to go with the words of faith and good doctrine. You see? How do you get strong in, in God's grace? How do you become a good minister? You've got to be strong in the words of faith and good doctrine. That's it. And 2 Timothy 2 is going to talk about that over and over again. How do you rightly divide the word? What is Paul saying? What's the right word? What's the vain words? What's the profane words? What do you say to people in this situation? How do you maintain the words? It's all about the words. Don't subvert people with words. Like over and over again, 2 Timothy 2 is talking about these words and doctrines, which is why the verse we put on banners rightly divide the word of truth. It's in this chapter. Yeah. This is talking about the importance of being strong in grace, which requires you take the word and use it and minister it properly. All right. Rightly divide the word of truth. So, that's what that means. 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. 2 Timothy 3, verse 14, Paul says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. <laughs> Why? Why is it so much about doctrine in this dispensation? I mean, can't, isn't it not just word only, but deed too? That's 1 John. John writes about that. Well, that's under a covenant program. In this dispensation, the deed is what Christ did. That's the word we preach, Amen. right? And so we have to learn the doctrine in order to believe it. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And if we have strong faith, then we got strong grace, where our strength comes from what Christ did. That's how that happens. That's the practical explanation of it. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Therefore, Paul says to Timothy, preach the word. Yeah. He doesn't say, do the deed. No, he says, preach the word. Like the action of Timothy, a good minister, is to preach the words. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Reprove what? If they got the words wrong, because evil communications corrupt good manners. Rebuke, because you're teaching a wrong thing. Correct them. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And that's the problem. That's the beginning of the decline in anybody's personal or national or in this dispensational response to God. The decline begins with ignoring the words of God, specifically as they were given to our apostles in the dispensation of grace. You turn away from Paul, it's the beginning of the decline. All they in Asia turned away from Paul, so it's not looking good for Timothy's future in ministry as far as he needs to resist that. He needs to preach the word, be strong in God's grace. All right. Whereas other people, other ministries may be strong in something else. Law keeping, for example. We're strong in the commandments. All right? Or strong in passion for Jesus, our feelings. Or strong in, you know, building up ministries. And look at the number of people. What did James say when Paul went to Jerusalem? Look at the number of people who are here that are zealous of the law. I'm sure Paul's rolling his eyes at that point going, yeah. How many of you got here that are strong in grace? Crickets, you know. Because that's what God's doing today. If you need soldiers in this dispensation, they're going to be soldiers of God's grace. Amen. That's a different thing. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Yeah. In 2 Timothy 1, verse 9 and 10, the message was, we're saved and got a holy calling according to his purpose and grace, not according to our works, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So without Christ, there is no salvation and calling for you. Right. So of course the grace is in Christ Jesus. But it's also important because in verses 9 through 10 of chapter 1, he was talking about how you get that. It was according to a purpose before the world began, not the prophetic purpose that we covered in detail in charts when we covered those verses. He's not saying be strong in the grace of the new covenant. That's not what he said. You say, why would he say that? Hebrews says this. Hebrews says that in chapter 10. There's grace in the new covenant. The spirit of grace. The throne of grace. But it's not grace in a new covenant. It's grace in Christ Jesus. Because you, in this dispensation, Timothy, Paul, are in the body of Christ according to the fellowship of the mystery. And so you're going to be strong in grace, the doctrine. If you know that, you know how you got that grace. It's in the mystery of Christ. It's in his body. Thus, it's in Christ Jesus. So there's no covenant promise that some nation has, Israel, that's going to keep you from God's grace because you understand this. Well, you can't get that forgiveness and blood and atonement unless you've got the covenant. Not according to Christ Jesus. If I'm in him, don't need a covenant. Amen. If I'm in him and it's his work, I don't need the law. 
Right? If I'm in him and his body as a Gentile, a new creature, I'm not Israel either. So this is strength, folks. I mean, we, we study that academically, but you know how strong a statement that is. You do not have to be a nation whom God created as the only nation to be blessed. There's no other nation, Psalm says, than Israel that has been blessed by God like they have. And you don't have to be Israel to get all spiritual blessings. Amen. That's strong. So it's not initials covenants. The grace is in Christ Jesus because he did the work and he gave the word. He gave the word to the Apostle Paul, appointed him, and now we have it. So that leaves us with chapter 2, verse 2, which will just scratch the surface and then we'll pick it up again next week. He says, Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, in the things that thou hast heard of me. The same commit thou, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Chapter 2 is filled with how to minister the word rightly because it's the word of grace. It's God's grace that strengthens us in Christ Jesus. It's about what is said. Notice in verse 2, the things that thou hast heard. What do you hear? Words, right? So there's things that are heard. In verse 7, consider what I say. Words, right? And the Lord give the understanding. Then in verse 9, wherein I suffer troubles and evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Amen. Oh, that's a strong word, I guess. Right? Verse 11, it is a faithful saying. We'll cover the faithful sayings in this chapter. Why does what you say matter? Because doctrines matter according to faithful workmanship. If you don't care about the doctrine, you're not a faithful workman. That's going to be the bottom line. Verse 15 then, you rightly divide the word of truth as an unashamed workman. If you're not doing that, you're, that's a shameful work. Not faithful. Verse 16, right after that verse, shun profane and vain babblings. Those are words, right? Verse 17, their word will eat us up the canker. You see, words matter. Yeah. What about all those people that are just sinning left and right? Paul's worried about the words here. Because the message of grace can save sinners. You see, you get the words wrong, the sin, <laughs> the sin's not going to solve, right? People get the cart before the horse. We're going to solve people's sin problem before we get them the word. And before you can start taking Bible class, you need to stop sinning. That's interesting, right? Which is like saying, before your first job, you need to pay me your life savings. It's like, how do I, how do I get out of that catch-22? The words matter. Verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection has passed already. They're erred, they're, they have made an error here because, and they overthrow the faith of some because of the words that they're communicating. Yeah. All right. Down to verse 23. Foolish and unlearned questions avoid. There's things people say. Paul says avoid those things. 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle until all men apt to teach. People read that verse in isolation. They go, well, I'm not a teacher. If you know the words of salvation, the gospel of salvation, if you know the gospel of grace, you know information from God's word, then you are able then to teach it. That's the idea. Yeah. Right? So, after to teach is something we should strive for. Verse 25, in meekness, instructing those. How do you instruct them? With words. Right? That they may acknowledge the truth, which is words. This whole chapter is about faithful workmanship regarding the words. What are the words? Chapter 1 dealt with the testimony. It dealt with the message in chapter 1. Chapter 2 is, therefore, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things you've heard, the things I've said, beware of these words. Make sure you don't use words that way. Make sure the words are pure. Right? Be strong in the words. Strong in the doctrine. Strong in God's grace. That's what he's saying. Right? We have the words. We need faithful, faithful workmen. Is what we need. How do you find them? How do you find faithful workmen? This is the age-old dilemma, right? Chapter, verse 2 is going to be how you multiply your ministry, how you continue the ministry into the future, future generations. When Paul's dead, there's Timothy. But is it going to die with Timothy? Is the ministry going to die right here? Or are there going to be people that carry it on because they're strong in God's grace? And they're able to, well, how, how then do you find these faithful workmen? I mean, a lot of people are zealous and want to do some work, but faithful is the attribute we're looking for. Right? Well, how do you get that? Well, you do that, remember I said before, people are attracted to people who are strong. Naturally they are. If you try to exhibit strength in your ministry any other way but God's grace, you'll create people that are attracted to that. You get it? 
But if you're strong in God's grace and the doctrines and the word, then people will be attracted to that. And you say, well, there's less people, but those are the faithful. Yeah. And that's what you're trying to find, faithful workmen. Yeah. Because without faithful workmen, the message dies. Okay. And so we need faithful workmen to commit this thing to so that God's word can save souls and see saints edified. Amen. So we'll pick that up again next week. Paul's instruction to Timothy to be strong in the grace is so that he can commit to faithful men and teach those faithful men to teach other people. And you can't commit or teach to people without you first being strong in the thing you're teaching. Right. right. So uh, we'll, we'll deal with that more next week, what a faithful man looks like, and start uh, verse 2 and 3. Any questions or comments about first verse, chapter 2? That was fun.